Welcome to an interview series by Loctopus. Today we are here to discuss the newly published book, The Punished. I have a copy of the book here with me. To discuss the book, we have two people who've been very closely involved in the making of the book. We have um, Dr. Janvi Mishra, who's the author of the book. We also have with us Dr. Anoop Surendranath, who's the research director at Project 39A, the organization on whose research this book is based on. Hi, Janvi. Hi, Anoop. It's great Hi. to have both of you here. Hi, Uman. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, so before um, like I gave an introduction to both of you, I saw that both of you have very diverse interests. So therefore, I thought it's best that if both of you like talk about the kind of work you do. So I'd want to ask the first question to the two of you that suppose if I didn't know the kind of work you do, Anoop and Janvi, and I was explaining to somebody who Anoop Surendranath is and who Janvi Mishra is. So what would the answer to that question be? Um, can we start with you, Janvi? Okay, so um, my um, I am a writer, researcher, and animator. Uh, my doctorate was on um, the feminist ethical theory of the ethics of care, um, which fits in quite well with this book, actually, because um, um, both the theory and the book are about seeing people as embedded within their social situations. Um, individuals evolving through their relationships with one another instead of being entirely separate or autonomous. Um, and I have uh, recently finished uh, an animated film on the death penalty um, called I Am Ramdeen, um, which is at the moment on the festival circuit. Thank you, Janvi. And um, Anu? Yeah, I mean, I'm a lawyer by training and... Uh... I, I teach law at National University Delhi, and uh, apart from that, uh, criminal justice uh, it has been a big area of interest since I first uh, took up the law teaching job at NLU Delhi in uh, August 2012, uh, and Project 39A has uh, been a big part of that uh, on various aspects of the criminal justice system. Um, my doctoral work is on uh, equality and affirmative action, but uh, very little of my work of the last eight years has been on uh, any of that. Uh, but yes, that's, that's who I am. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I see that both of you are um, like very involved with the criminal justice system and the death penalty project. So one thing which I was wondering while reading this book is how did this book come along? Because like the death penalty project report came out in 2016 and this book has come out in 2021. So um, Anup, I'd want to ask you this, while working on the death penalty project, did you like envisage that a couple of years down the line, you would want to like have a book out of this so that like it's more accessible to like a number of people? Uh, no, not really, <laughs> not really. I, I think when we were doing the death penalty research project between 2013 to 2016, I don't think uh, I imagined that our criminal justice work would become what it has become through Project 39A. It was meant to be a one-off research project and that uh, I would move on to other things, but uh, I guess uh, things just turned out very, very differently. But yes, as far as this book is concerned, uh, it became very evident through the interview process and while after the interview process, while we were writing the more legal academic report on this, which is the death penalty in their report, that so much of what we had heard and felt wasn't captured in that format of a big, thick academic report. And that while that certainly has value and is very important to do that kind of uh, legal work, uh, empirical legal work. Uh, so we felt that while as, as a law school, it was important to put out the empirical research and uh, the legal work on it through the Death Penalty India report, uh, it was just as important to communicate that research in a manner uh, that is accessible to a much broader audience in a powerful, accessible manner. Uh, and that's why we embarked on uh, writing uh, these stories. Uh, well, writing these stories has, ha has been its own experience, uh, but uh, uh, we, we were so glad to have uh, uh, engaged with Janvi on this and, 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 and the book is uh, a perfect, uh, outcome of sort of what we had imagined and what we would have wanted. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because um, like I, I was also reading that book a couple of times, like suddenly it, it hit me that, oh, like this is how the justice system is. 
and that's also something which is very remarkable because like having studied law for 5 years these are the kind of stories i like while knew which were there but didn't realize the magnitude of it or didn't like connect with them as closely so um so congratulations to the two of you because i think this is a very very well executed project uh, thank you so uh, so at this point where was the like where, how did you get involved in the project janvi and how did that interaction take place of you coming on board and then deciding to convert the research and carry your own interviews to turn this book into what it is so i was um, i was given uh, transcripts of the interviews by uh, project 39a and um, that's how my research into the project started um, and i was equally um, um, disturbed um, as 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 you said reading about how how these things how these things unfold and how um how unjust it it um really is uh, the system um in certain ways um so yeah um that's that's how my research start started i um 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 i was given the interviews and uh, then i kind of looked at media reports on these uh, cases uh, that was the second stage of my research um and then after i was kind of um, um i had done a thorough amount of research on the prisoners i began writing okay so uh, like was this also because like your work primarily also is on the death penalty um project and generally around um like the criminal justice system is that how no, no my my work is not generally on um, um the criminal justice system at all i'm i was just a writer and uh, they they, um, they liked stuff that i wrote and kind of asked me to write um, okay yeah yeah so uh, that's how it happened and uh, yeah but my work is not primarily on uh, uh, the death penalty although there are connections as i mm. said with my research work with uh, with my basic work on the ethics of care there are certain uh, exciting overlaps and um, i hope to actually develop this a bit in an article or something <laughs> yeah so um, in the beginning of the book anup you write that how your legal training did not equip you to deal with the kind of like research work which you were doing as part of like project 39a between the time of like 2013 to 2016 so um like can you tell us a little bit about that because like i realize i also have never visited a prison so what was that experience like visiting a prison for the first time talking to people who are on the like death or who are like on death penalty uh, sentences and like what are some instances which hit you and you realize that okay wow this is how the prison system is and this is something which i never imagined it to be so can you tell us something about that process right i think uh, while i had academically read quite a bit about the realities of death row and uh, you know a lot of american literature on it uh, academic literature on it and one had read the case law and everything so there is an abstract understanding of the issue uh, of saying how does death penalty function in a criminal justice system um and and while that uh, abstract understanding is there but i think just that human experience of meeting people and uh, uh, faces to the names and those experiences right uh, just the suffering and the desperation and the helplessness right uh, that is something no i guess no academic literature can uh capture right uh, and and i think it's only works and books and the way janmi imagines it and writes it that's that's capable of capturing that kind of experience uh and i think uh for me uh, uh just yes it was my first visit or or experience with prisons and i i got to see so many prisons across the country way deep into uh the uh, the prison complex in that sense uh into the barracks where they lived um you know um and and that was uh, i don't think uh just just being in in these spaces of prisons across the country um uh and 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 just in the kind of access we were given um just those spaces uh you know just just how they are built how they are structured the the daily practices of the prison uh, are all such factors that contribute to the darkness of these spaces right uh, and that uh, and that there's so much more to the punishment 
uh, that doesn't get captured as an abstract issue unless you go and see these spaces and see how they're made to live their lives. Um, and, and just to hear their stories, uh, and for me particularly, what was difficult um, uh, where, where uh, I don't know, just these, these gruesome tales of torture uh, and uh, while during the investigation stage and people uh, showing me uh, the marks of those torture on their bodies um, to a complete stranger that they just met. Um, and, 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 uh, and also very often uh, in the presence of uh, female researchers uh, and note takers. And then just that, and just the need of, uh, and just, and just the, the feeling from the prisoners of, of, of wanting to tell their story, to wanting to convince us of saying that this happened to us, to prove it to us and show their marks on their body. And yet that sense of reluctance and sh shame with the presence of uh, female note takers there, right? Uh, I mean, just they're grappling with that. Those are all very difficult things that uh, nobody ever tells you that these are things you're going to confront and how to navigate those uh, how to navigate those times uh, and then situations uh, and put people at comfort. Uh, it's, so those are, uh, and I guess those are, ex those very human experiences is what made me realize that uh, this work uh, cannot just be a research project that ends in May, 2016. And that uh, I guess somewhere there's an ethical responsibility to carry it forward. Yeah, and um, like I'd also like to take you a step back. So you're talking about how the project like ended. So like I'd want to know like how did this project start in the first place? Like what was this idea behind conducting such a like a death penalty, pro like a conducting a report at such a like a large level at a nationwide scale? And like how did that start? Um, like this idea that NLU Delhi will have a center which will work on the death penalty and this other research is going to be conducted. Can you tell us about like that time? I believe that's somewhere around the 2012s. And also, yeah, like so a little, at that, yeah. And also at like that a, point, at that point, it was not meant to be a center. It was only meant to be a project. And for me, quite frankly, the immediate trigger was uh, uh, the, uh, the execution of Afzal Guru and the manner, the completely secretive manner in which the UPA government carried it out uh, in Tihar. And it just made me I mean, I guess it just drove home the point that we know so little about the death penalty in India. We don't know who gets it, how they get it, um, you know. And given how little we knew about the death penalty, we felt that it was important that such a divisive issue be informed by the empirical realities of this. Uh, and, and that's the reason why we got into this um, and, we, and then the university supported the research project uh, and, and when, and when we uh, saw all of these things, I like guess a big thing that was too obvious to ignore was the quality of legal representation that prisoners on death row were receiving. Um, and, and therefore then the decision to start uh, assisting in pro bono representation of uh, death row prisoners. And um, Janvi, I'd like to ask you this, how did this process like change your perception of the criminal justice system? And how did it transform, like how you view the legal system in the country? Yeah, um, with regards to the death penalty, I have always found it ethically suspect. I have always been against it. But um, getting involved in this and reading the interviews was a completely different matter. It, it, not, it did not only strengthen my belief that, um, the, uh, that the death penalty is uh, um, is it, it, ethically somewhat, it, it, it's not ethically right, but also um, it, it kind of shook me a little, the kind of uh, problems there are with the system, the, the many loopholes there are in the system. And the big question that, 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 that raised was whether uh, a system that is not without loopholes, is, is the death penalty viable? Does it make sense in a system such as this? Um, um, so yeah, that was the big uh, um, um, question uh, that for me, that that was a, a, a big revelation uh, in terms of the many, many problems that there are with the system and the kind of things that the uh, convicts go through 
in terms of torture, in terms of the lack of representation, um, how inaccessible uh, the system is to you if you do not have the resource. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's quite shocking. Yeah, did it somewhere along the way also like make you a little apprehensive of the process or made you lose faith in the system a little given like how bad the situation is? Absolutely. I mean, you, you start questioning. I, I, it, did make me, uh, it did make me question uh, the system a lot more. Um, we generally have a slight distrust of, say, uh, um, the police and things like that as a society. But uh, this, this made me question uh, the judicial system as well. This made me question um, a lot of other things as well. Yes. And um, like, what was the idea behind picking these 19 stories which you've written? Um, like, were there also stories that um, like you were working on which didn't go in the book? So um, like any relevance of these 19 stories or were they, these the stories in which you also found like enough background material to sort of write the stories you wanted to write? Or... Yeah. Um, yeah, I was given a range of interviews, but um, I chose uh, the stories that to me seemed uh, to provide a broad, a broad, range of perspectives of, of the convicts um, um, so that they are not repetitive. But also uh, the fact that uh, um, I, I chose stories uh, or cases where, uh, you know, where, where, where the media had been talking about um, uh, these people a lot more and there was a lot more, uh, th there was a lot more that I could uh, research um, um, on, on, on uh, those are the cases that I picked out. Um, but mostly to kind of give a broad, broad range of perspectives. Yeah. And also one thing which I found very interesting was how the stories were presented. Like these are like short three or four page stories, which are very evocative. And also like somewhere it, um, like it leaves you um, in some ways, like it doesn't give you closure in most of these stories because like it's building up to like what the problems are which these inmates are facing. And then like it ends there where you're left thinking that, oh, like this is how their lives are right now. Yeah. So was this I also, guess, um, no, please go ahead. I guess it is, um, uh, they are reflective of what the prisoners go through. I, I guess there is no, to me, it seemed as if there was no closure for them either. And that is what I try to convey um, through the stories. Um, yeah, and, and I chose the vignette form because uh, um, the, 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 See, these are not direct transcriptions of mm. the prisoners' experiences, as I say in the author's note. But what I could be most faithful to uh, were their emotional states or mental states. So uh, that's what I tried to do in this, um, in, through this vignette form, so that together the stories could convey a sense of what they go through. Yeah. So was this a deliberative process or was this, um, or was this something which you also discovered along the way that you decided, okay, I have to write a book on these stories. Let's see how it goes. And this is the form you ended with, or did it, or was it something which you had in mind, like since the beginning that, oh, these are how my stories should be to have the maximum impact. Like how was the process of like formulating these stories for the book? Yeah. Um, um, I guess after I read the interviews is when I decided that this is how um, I would like to convey uh, their experiences. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't quite um, um, say when mm. I realized this is how I want to do it, but I think definitely after I read the interviews and I found that uh, um, the best way to represent um, uh, the convicts was to, uh, was to show their or portray their, um, uh, their, their emotional and mental states rather than their external circumstances, if you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah. 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 So since this book draws so much from the death penalty project report, Anup, I'd want to ask you this, that while working on the report, like when the results came, uh, like when you were arriving at the findings, what, like what are the kind of things which like even shook you? Because like, since you'd been working for such a long time, so were these, were there also findings which you realized went against like your understanding of how the death penalty inmates were and like what, what are like based on that, what are the kind of general misconceptions which you think exist in the society right now about yeah. these people, which, um, which like your work has been largely trying to um, clarify. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, a, a, a few things really. I mean, one, one would think at the level of an abstract issue, there are certain things that I think are, are rather counterintuitive in our findings, um, uh, you know, in terms of um, um, the legal representation and the whole idea that death row prisoners have always had legal aid lawyers throughout. That's not true. Uh, in, in, the, in the trial courts, in the, in the first instance, they do have private lawyers, but very bad legal representation nonetheless. Um, so there are those um, uh, abstract uh, discussions and, and points about the issue that are, there are some that are quite counterintuitive uh, there in the report. Uh, but, but I think for me, it was very revealing as, as an experience with my students, um, many of whom uh, who didn't really know what to think about the death penalty and the kind of cases that uh, these, uh, uh, these persons were involved in, uh, just to see them experience what it is to go and talk to that person rather than just reading a judgment of the high court or of a trial court. What it, what it then transforms into when you go and meet that person and hear their stories that, that there's so much to them apart from that judgment or what, is, what a judgment is capable of carrying, uh, in, 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 I mean, carrying about that person. Uh, it was an incredible exercise and made me really think that I wonder if, if people really could hear them, could, if, if, if a general public could hear people on death row and hear what their lives are, um, what their lives are about and what their lives have been about, uh, what impact that would uh, uh, make on them. Um, right? And, 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 it, and, it, and, and it really was uh, to see the kind of change it brought about in students about about nearly 100 of them across three years, um, you know, that, that was, as, as a teacher, uh, it, it was an incredible experience. Um, more broadly on issues, I would think, it really made me question, uh, one would think that um, people would want to live at any cost, right? Um, uh, and, 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 and there's, and, and in response to that question or, or that discussion, right? Do people want to live? Uh, it's such a complicated layered uh, responses that we got from different people. Uh, and, and that really makes you question so many things of uh, when you represent prisoners on death row, what does it mean, right? Uh, some of them, some, I mean, I think for me, so many of them came back with a response that, you know, us being alive is continuing the suffering for our families, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that it is better that if you are just hanged and this is finished, yes, they would grieve for six months or a year, but at least they would move on with their lives. Uh, and, and, and then that is so much better than this current set of circumstances where uh, they can't live their lives. They have to keep thinking about us, uh, worrying about us, spending money on us. And then it's like their lives are stuck uh, because of us. Uh, but yeah, I mean, those kind of insights, uh, I guess no academic uh, literature on the death penalty and the law would tell you. And uh, yeah, it, it, it really uh, was challenging. Really, that is really interesting, Anu, because yeah, then you, you see that the death penalty is not just about the killing of one individual. It is such a, uh, it is such a complex thing. It is not about whether you want to live or die. It is about families, it is about society, it is about systemic um, inequality. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. And, and this question of closure, I think is, you know, has been covered. <laughs> you know, why, for me, it is fascinating that people, some people have come back with a reaction saying that, why isn't there closure in these stories, right? And for me, that's great. That's precisely what we want to achieve. We wanted to achieve that you want to know more about these people, right? Uh, and if these stories have done that, if they have left you wanting to know more uh, about these 19 people, uh, that's the greatest success we could have, right? That we have moved the needle uh, from you just wanting to know the crime, right? Uh, that and, and that, for me, is a great thing. I, I know it's a source of frustration for some people that, oh, why isn't the story... Yeah. Uh, there, why isn't there a beginning and an end, right? Yeah. Uh, right, and that's 
great. I mean, that's and I think that's a uh, that's the tremendous success of the form that uh, Jami has chosen, right? It leaves you wanting more, and and that is perfect for the project that we set out with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like one uh, thing which I related to a lot was like apart from the closure factor was also the sense of frustration. Like when you read the kind of like charges on which people have been like put behind bars and given the death penalty. For example, that one incident where um where like a cellar um where a body was found in a police station in a um in a bag, and there like they they had taken one person and they. they asked this person that okay what kind of a job you do he said you i used to sell rice and this and the police asked ki acha what did you sell rice and he said ki i used to sell rice in a jute bag so and because the body was found in a jute bag they said oh this is the person who must have um, like killed and thrown the body in the police station so that just makes you feel that oh is the process like so fallible that like these are things which won't even stand say like in a parliamentary debate if you had to like talk about like logic but these are things which stand in a court of law to the extent that you are taking somebody's life so that was so that was very very moving so um but yeah based on this answer i have a lot i have like lots of questions let's all take that one by one so the first thing which i wanted to ask you anup was do you see the situation getting better because you worked in the field for now close to a decade so what are kind of conversations or generally like the representation or the kind of awareness which you saw say back in 2013 2012 and has that been changing or and in what direction has it been getting worse getting better can you talk about that yeah i mean that's a it's a difficult question i guess i look at these things of uh questions of change and everything very differently from when i graduated as a law student in 2006 mm. uh, i look at it very differently now i mean it's uh it's very very slow it's frustrating mm. slow right and uh, sometimes uh the the biggest contribution you can do is to hold fort right is to not lose battles right is to not to not let the law regress or go back in time right uh, and that very often is a is very often we underestimate the challenge of that mm. that the law does not go to a worse off position right uh, and and i think and just in that sense just holding fort is a big part of the battle let alone questions of reform right and 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 i think in work like this uh it's very important to ensure that you are not treating people in an instrumental fashion right these cases that we do uh they do not exist for us for strategic victories right uh that we must do always what is in the best interest of the client even if it is not in the best interest of strategic litigation right and that that's very often uh uh a very challenging thing to do because the temptation is so huge to push the strategic question right to push uh, many aspects of the strategic question right um and and and, and, and a great i mean for us a great example of that was one of the prisoners that we represented who who had uh, a sort of an advanced stage of uh, aids and uh, was hiv positive the, the tremendous amount of uh, prison ne- neglect on uh treatment and diagnosis and everything and it would have been a great case to litigate in the supreme court to say that uh people at that kind of terminal stage should not be kept on death row right uh and and that there's no point keeping people like that on death row but the truth of the matter is the person when we went and asked him whether he would like that was a very clear that no such thing should be done right uh because he'd rather stay in prison uh than stay in hospital because the previous experience of him going to hospital as been that he was so he was treated so badly by the doctors and the nurses there that they wouldn't even talk to him would not even touch him that that in prison he got so much more respect and dignity from his co prisoners on death row that they would come and check on him or give him a glass of water that that he'd rather have that uh than go and uh, live in a hospital and suffer the indignity of uh, what he had seen yeah so so these are uh i mean these are so change in that sense you know we often tend when I, mean, i guess with age one realizes these things that uh, it's not these big uh, dramatic uh, things and what we might be i mean like over time one uh, uh, sort of there's a certain course correction of what one can expect in one's lifetime uh, and and as i said sometimes just holding fort is the biggest thing that you can do 
yeah yeah definitely so um so the next question um like related to this is um like to both of you so like while giving this answer also the focus was a lot about like humanizing these people in the sense that these people shouldn't just be looked at from the prison of their crime but like as people themselves so like while working on the project and the book like what is the thing you are um, like trying to achieve by way of like showing the human aspect are you trying to show that um, like people are product of their circumstances and therefore these are situations in which they've been put in are you also trying to show that the process is so fallible that nobody should be put on that penalty no matter what crime they have done is it both so um, like can you talk a little bit about uh, a, a little bit about this humanizing factor and like how you think that plays a role in people's perception of these crimes these criminals the law um should i what i wanted to show um through the stories is the the commonalities that we all share as human beings by shifting focus away from the crime and uh, to 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 the feelings and and to the inner lives of of the prisoners um um i humanized them stories by kind of showing by representing the commonalities that we share as human beings i think it is very important to see uh, to to kind of for 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 us to um, engage with these stories and to um and and for this for for this to be brought home the fact that they are human beings because uh, um uh, th- because the system works in that way by dehumanizing is how uh, uh, by dehumanizing an individual is how you uh, um feel it's okay uh, to kind of uh, kill them off or, or or kind of not 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 care about what happens to them um so yeah that that was that that was the aim behind the book um and this is how i managed it by kind of uh, uh, shifting the focus away from the crime and um anu i'd also like want to ask as a follow up to that anu that um do you also at some level feel that this um like how do you balance this humanizing aspect and this like objectivity of the law aspect because um like a lot of people might say that um like when you're like not humanizing them it's better because then the law is objective in that sense so then there do you feel that say a stance against death penalty comes from a very different like prism of how you view like society and humans all together or is this something which like works in that paradigm also where you want the law to be like neutral to be objective but like also view these people as like humans yeah i mean i i absolutely agree with janvi that uh, crucial to the or integral to the retentionist project on the death penalty is dehumanizing people right mm. and i think the objectivity that we speak of uh, is 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 often uh, an unnatural one right it's 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 uh, it's a certain program of the law to through that objectivity to dehumanize right uh, mm. and, and 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 objectivity often is uh, a, <laughs> a covering word for dehumanizing right um, and i think even even if you took took it as a very strictly legal process knowing about the lives of people that you are about to sentence is necessarily a part of the legal process right and that's the law that's what's required but we rarely ever see that being presented in court right that that the lives of these people who are you punishing uh, is a requirement under the law of the land but is so rarely done because you're being represented by uh, you you are getting very terrible legal representation you do not have expertise at your end right and and for me it's very simple if the state is so interested in taking life of individuals uh, there has to be a gold standard of the process right and the gold standard of the process is that we better know about the lives of these people and who they are their context where they come from even as part of the formal legal process right um and we better we better invest in that and that's the fight right irrespective of whether we agree on the death penalty or whether it should be there or not the process has to be of a gold standard and and it's very far from that uh, as of now as far as a book is concerned i think the broader project of a, is of a social conversation right uh and and it is to uh somewhere disrupt the social conversation and say that we need to move away from an abstract discussion of the death penalty right and make it about people and their lives and society and what society does or does not do uh through telling these stories um 
on. And that's the way, and, and the idea in these social conversations, you can't shove an opinion down anyone's throat that will just mm. push people away, is to get people to engage on their own, think on their own, leave them with questions. Um, and I think that's what the book uh, does so well, right? If I can say so myself. <laughs> And uh, really, the idea of objectivity to me is an interesting one. I take it with a pinch of salt because I feel power relations are always in play. Mm. Uh, and the dominant group decides what is objective and what isn't. Yeah, yeah, that's true. In fact, um, like I was going through the death penalty report and I saw that 75% of the people who like who are on the um, who are like death row prisoners right now belong to like marginalized communities who are people who never completed their schooling. So these are also, I think, very telling factors, which just make you question and think that at least something must be wrong if like most of the people who are on these, like who are on the death row are belonging to a certain community. But, um, but again, like as uh, like while both of you are talking about like how we view the process, like this reminded me of something like very um, recent because like I was watching like your other interviews on the book at uh, like which are there on YouTube. And I saw some comments on uh, on these videos, which also like made me feel that oh, these are kind of like these are kind of people who should read the book in the first place because they were saying that, oh, why do you want to uh, like, why do you want to understand their story? These are people who, who should be dead. Why do you want to like waste your resources feeding these people. So, so that's what like, I think like the problem also is very, very pertinent. And like, it's also a direct interaction of like this book also based on the fact that these were comments on the video of like an interview of both of you. So yeah, at the yeah. end of the, at the end of the day, people from both sides of the debate should be able to pick up the book. Um, hmm. this is, um, 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 the book is not a propaganda piece what is most important is for people to be engaging with these stories, whether you agree with the agenda or not. Yeah. Yeah. So this brings me to the next question, Janvi, is where do you see the role of say art and literature in like having more conversations around these? Because say last year, a book came out by Megha Majumdar called The Burning, which also dealt with very similar aspects that one person had just like put something on Facebook where like a train had been burned criticizing the government then like this person was the one who was targeted for like being um, like one of the main conspirators for this bomb blast. And then they were like sent to the sent for um, like the death penalty. And like that takes you to the entire process where a person doesn't know what's happening to them, but they are still like just trudging along as other people are deciding what should happen to their lives. And um, like that for me was a very powerful moment because like I felt I was like put in the shoes of somebody who would be like in that sort of, sort of a situation, although like I think that's also like a big, big gap given that I'm just like reading a book based on somebody's experience. But um, like, where do you feel that these things such as movies, art, fiction plays a role in like having these conversations among people? I think, I think it's absolutely essential. I mean, in this particular case, in the case of this book, it's definitely proven to be very productive this kind of coming together of uh, law and art. Um, but yeah, generally people see lawyers and the law as, um, you know, detached and clinical. And uh, so I think this injection of, of feeling and emotion into, in, into these kinds of discourses, I think is, is extremely uh, productive. And uh, yeah, um, we were talking about objectivity. And, and again, um, I don't think it is, really possible to be completely mm. objective and I think um, yeah as I said the dominant group decides what is uh, objective and what is not so when you bring in uh, uh, some, some, something artistic where you know uh, uh, people can engage with, with, with an idea beyond arguments and abstractions um, these things start to become a little bit more clear um, and uh, yeah, I think it's I think I think it's it's it's, it's essential and it's wonderful for um, um, artists to to explore uh, political um, ideas um, of this kind. I think it's a very productive nexus. Yeah, um, and um, Anup, so how how do you see the reception of like both the things because you've been involved with the um, with the report also and this book. So what are the kind of like conversations you see with STEM out of the report, which came out in 2016 and the book and like, how do they two like differ and also like interact in yeah. at the same time? So, I am skeptical of the capacity of the law um, 
to have these conversations in any um, comprehensive manner, right? Uh, and I think we need to these extremely divisive uh, questions on, I mean, socially divisive questions uh, need to be freed from the clutches of the law. Right? And, 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 the, and the conversations that the law is capable of having on these things is from very limited perspectives, right? Uh, and, and I think that's often the frustration of the legal conversations. And, I th- and, and this engagement with these issues through the perspective of various uh, art forms, right, is absolutely essential if we are going to have meaningful social conversations, right? Uh, and so therefore, let's just answer the first part of that question. Uh, on, on the reception between the article, I mean, on the, on the report, yes, the report had uh, an interesting purchase uh, with, within the legal community and the social scientists uh, who are interested in the interaction between social science and criminal justice. So there was significant interest that uh, this kind of empirical work, academic work had been done, uh, but very little purchase outside that. Yes, there was significant interest from the press in terms of the socioeconomic profile and all of that, was, that there was that coverage. But I, I don't think uh, it, it got people thinking about the death penalty at a very human level. It still got people thinking about the death penalty who were interested in the death penalty at a very abstract issue level, right? And I think that conversation can go only that far. And unless we engage with people as both in terms of the people suffering the death penalty and people also supporting the death penalty from the outside, unless we engage with them at a very human, emotional level, uh, we are not going to be able to push this social conversation forward. Yeah. And, and, and the book is an uh, interesting way to do that. And, 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 and it has encouraged us to look for more avenues uh, to do this kind of more broader public engagement uh, on these stories and the issue as such. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so because you mentioned that even um, like people on the other spectrum were supporting that penalty. Um, so I wanted to ask like you this in terms of um, like I think abolishing death penalty is something which is um, which is I think the last step but like before that what are some what are the other say practical changes that you would want to see like even from the pers- from side of people who support the death penalty in terms of like better legal representation maybe in terms of um, in terms of just the per- person being more involved in the process like the convict being more involved because like in most of the stories, this was also a common theme that people didn't understand the language which was going on after a while. They just felt that the lies were outside, taken outside their control completely and somebody else was in charge of that. So in that sense, can you talk about like some practical changes which like everyone, like even law students, lawyers or general public should like look to implement when like you're dealing with crimes like which have like a stipulation of death penalty? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of agreement that can be had between people who support the death penalty and who don't support the death penalty, as far as the fairness of the process is concerned, that you cannot be using planted evidence, you can't uh, uh, use torture-based evidence, you have to have proper legal representation, the requirements of the law have to be followed, right? Even in cases that uh, we we argue in the Supreme Court, right, Uh, where we brief senior lawyers, they're not all abolitionists, right? But they are all very strongly committed to the fairness of the process, right? And, and, and as I was saying earlier, that needs, that adherence to the process has to be at a very, very high level when we're talking of taking somebody's life. Uh, and therefore, uh, in, and, and I think a big thing that doesn't get done is as the law requires is saying that when you are, once you found the person guilty and you're about to sentence them, you should have information about the offender, right? And that information is barely ever presented in court, right? And a lawyer is not going to be able to go and get this information, right? Uh, You're going to need uh, uh, social workers, you're going to need mental health experts to go. You're basically asking people, offenders and their families to open up the darkest aspects of their lives. And that's a very complicated uh, psychological dynamic between two people, right? You're, you're, you as a stranger suddenly going asking me, tell me everything about your family, right? And, and, and how you grew up and uh, what led 
to these circumstances it's not easy for people to speak about those things right um and and again the law the while the law requires it as a matter of legal process it's difficult for the law to really imagine how this is to be brought into the courtroom okay um but yeah that's that's the challenge of uh, doing this work i suppose yeah um but then like because this like seems so difficult like what are the like smallest steps you can think of which um like people can like work towards and uh, like we which people should be mindful of when like dealing with like criminal cases generally while representing them because like what you're talking about get, getting the entire story out of a person is also something which just seems like a herculean task but in terms of say somebody who's starting out in um, as a criminal lawyer as somebody who's like a bright eyed um person who wants to bring out some change or wants to start a career in criminal law what are kind of things which um like they should look to do which which like doesn't take much effort but is still being like neglected right now in the process i think as you as you would do if with any other case right uh chase every goddamn lead right uh right and and if it's not chased down uh in the trial courts it becomes so much more difficult to do it in the appellate courts right uh to to look at the evidence very very closely um you know there are always gaps and leads that must be pursued which are rarely ever pursued because these are people who are very poor and are not paying their lawyers much money at all and therefore those leads are not pursued right mm. lawyers don't turn up in court for cross examination of uh when you're defending a, a, a possible a uh, capital crime right they don't turn up for cross examination they don't turn up for sentencing hearings even if you were just doing the basic ethical thing of representing your client you would be doing a good great service and that is not what we see in these cases right uh it's just abysmal the kind of legal representation that they get and it would be unacceptable in any other context this is possible just because these are extremely poor vulnerable and marginalized people that uh law, that the lawyers tend to treat them a certain way and the system does not really raise a stink about it no oh, and uh, and janvi as say somebody who's not um like a trained lawyer in that sense when you interacted so closely with the um with this while while working on this book like what were the instances where you felt that oh this is something which like should be a given which should be done like no matter what but like you were asked surprised to find out these are also things which are not followed in these kind of cases so did you also have like any um, like moments like these where you felt that this is something which you never imagined would happen but um, like is a reality all the time uh, in all of the interviews all, everything was uh, extremely shocking because as I, as you said i'm not a lawyer so these things are i'm not i'm i'm not familiar with at all um, I, i wasn't till i read the interviews and uh, so yeah it was extremely shocking the kind of representation they had sometimes the prisoners would talk about not having spoken to the lawyer at all mm. um, sometimes the convicts wouldn't understand a word of 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 what's happening in their cases um um so yeah um, but it was it was extremely um shocking and um yeah and uh, while working on such a project for like such a long period of time did you also feel at some point that you were getting desensitized to the entire process where you felt that oh like the system's just wrong and this is how and we have to live with that so were um like also these moments like present during like the work on the no, book i never i never felt the system is wrong and i we just need to re- reconcile with that not at all i mean i it always made me angry hmm. uh, never i did not feel numb to that uh, my danger was uh, uh getting too involved in the stories because i was trying to kind of obviously uh put myself in their in their place to write these stories so that was m- mentally challenging in that way uh, uh so there i had to try and numb myself a little and how i did that re- when i think about it retrospectively is by doing as much research as i could and uh, distancing myself from the person that i'm writing about in that way um also uh, thinking about how best to convey the story structurally this and that um again kind of putting some distance between myself and 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 the and and, and the person whose mental space i'm trying to access 
but yeah, in that in in that respect, I did try and kind of step back a little, numb myself a little. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, the legal process and the kinds of things they have to go through, and 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 the lack of representation and things like that, I was never I never felt that oh we just have to kind of deal with it. Mm. Uh, I always that always got me angry. Yeah, and uh, what about you, Anu? Did you ever feel at any point that you were getting like numb by the process because you just been dealing with these things for like day in and day out for such a long period of time? Yeah, I mean, I think um, over the years uh, things shock you less and less, I guess. Uh, but I think it's important to uh, keep the anger about the injustice going, right? Um, uh, that's very important and not to um, reconcile to saying this is how the system is and the idea is very much to resist mm -hmm. that normalization of that injustice right um, and uh, it's challenging it's not easy to do it on a day in and day out uh, basis um, and you're you're forced to pick your battles uh, and those are terrible terrible choices to make sometimes um, uh, but there's no other way I mean the idea is to uh, channel that anger and uh, but as as as, as Jani was also saying uh, it's about how you use that anger about the injustice right there are very productive ways of using it and also there can be some disastrous ways of putting uh, putting it to uh, use right so just to be careful about that uh, but I think it's very important not to say oh this is how the system is and that's how it's going to be and I can't do anything about it and I think doing, I mean, and in many ways, doing this work is also the ultimate statement of your faith in the system, mm -hmm. right? That, that doing it and engaging it, engaging with this through the system is you acknowledging that the system is capable of change, right? Uh, and for me, therefore, um, that is my ultimate uh, act of reposing faith in the system, right? Uh, it, is it messed up? Yes, but can, can the system be made better? I think it, it can. And, and, and therefore, it's, this is not, this work is not an abandonment of the system. It is investing in the system, right? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, like I think the balance which you're talking about is, like I personally find it very hard to, um, to strike because like in term, in the conversations I've had say with my friends who are just starting out as lawyers, like this is, I think one thing which um, like is a common thread where people say that, Oh, like this is something which we feel we get too involved in and therefore like it will take a toll on us. So, um, so is that balance also something which like develops over time and like you also decide like which battles to pick and where to channelize your energy or like, are there also things which like people can keep in mind to ensure that they don't get like burnt out or they don't get, um, like disillusioned by the entire process. Yeah, and that's a serious threat. And then I guess uh, uh, it's not easy for people to work on these cases. And then over the years, we've realized the importance of um, uh, investing in the mental health of uh, colleagues who work on these cases, who are on the front line of these uh, fighting these cases. and just repeatedly hearing these cases and working on these cases, meeting the prisoners and their families does take its toll. Um, and, and, and I think uh, you have to acknowledge to yourself and come to terms with the fact that change is going to be slow, right? Uh, and if you don't, and if you, uh, if, if, you, if you come in and you think you're just going to uh, slash and burn, um, it's, it's, it's going to lead to a lot of disappointment, right? Because the system will get to you, will get to you invariably, right? Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's incredibly challenging work. And, and I think that's not just for the death penalty. I think it's any kind of cause lawyering. Uh, um, you know, you have to be uh, prepared for the long haul, uh, right? Um, and, 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 and I think it's, very important, I think, in, in spaces there to be kind to each other and support each other in these extremely stressful times, right? Um, yeah, it's, that's what I would say. Big, big risk of disillusionment, but uh, yeah. very important to think of strategies to counter that. And you should come in with, if people are interested in this kind of cause lawyering, 
should come in with very clear ideas of how they will counter the disease. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and Charmi, you also worked on an animation film uh, based on the death penalty. Can you talk about that? Like what the film is about? Yeah. Um, uh, um, so I can, it's a very short um, animation film um, where, where I, I co-directed it and I used paper and uh, uh, clay um, in, in the animation. Uh, so um, that is, I mean, it, it asks a range of questions. Uh, one is, um, why are there, why is there such a vast proportion of uh, poor people on death row in India? And uh, uh, why, uh, how, how accessible is the system uh, to these very same people who are punished in this way? Um, uh, and, how, and how the system then, when it is so as inaccessible as it is, how it becomes like, you know, it, 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 it takes on those proportions of, of, of uh, godlike proportions where you can't question anything. Uh, the, the, the convict can't question they're just given the sentence, um, uh, whatever that sentence may be. Um, so yeah, um, and lastly, of course, um, does it make sense? Does the death penalty make sense in a, in a system that is, um, frankly, uh, fairly, you know, has has as many loopholes as it does? Um, yeah. So it, uh, yeah, it, oh. it was born out of my experience of writing the book, um, the film. And uh, yeah, it's a poem that I wrote and then co-animated. Okay, so now like in future, are you looking to do more of these sort of projects where you would want to um, like take an academic piece of work and turn it into something which is more accessible to people given the kind of like impact and conversations you've seen around this book? Uh, well, um, I, I, I am very seriously looking uh, to try and um, uh, explore more this, this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, ethics of care and how that fits in with, with something like um, or, or what light it could throw on, on the death penalty um, uh, do an article on that but um, generally my academic work and my uh, creative writing do tend to kind of uh, come together in certain ways um, yeah um, yeah so yeah that will continue to happen I guess like the novel that I'm writing um, explores feminine sexuality um, and so does my research work. So yeah, it, that, that does happen with my work, but, uh, and that's natural, I guess. But yeah, I would continue to, in, in terms of the death penalty, I will be um, hopefully trying to develop an article. Okay, and um, like while I was reading this book, like one thing which I, um, which like I realized after a few chapters was so common, was the mental health of like the people on the death row. So, um, so can both of you talk a little about like how that experience was when interacting with these people and like how it's, and it seemed that uh, this is also something which was very neglected because um, like in a couple of stories, the doctors just gave them sedatives and said, oh, this is going to help you. But there was like nobody tackling or like no conversation around how the mental health of these prisoners is. So how was um, like that experience like and um, like how did that impact like your work and how you looked at it when you saw that people are get, getting affected by this so closely in terms of like just themselves and that also not being addressed at all. So that is one area that uh, we were quite, we found that was quite widely prevalent and was an issue, but during the research project also found ourselves to be uh, completely uh, lacking the competence to really delve into greater detail. Uh, so recognizing that we, uh, we, we've we invested quite significantly in uh, looking at the mental health of death row prisoners and we have a, a pretty big report coming out uh, in a couple of months now okay. uh, on the mental health of death row prisoners. Um, uh, so yeah, so we're quite excited about that and uh, that yes, but it was a recognition during the project that it's a big issue neglected issue requiring quite a bit of expertise. Um, and uh, so we're quite excited about uh, the, the study that's coming out soon uh, on the mental health of that profession specifically. Yeah. 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 And while um, reading about this, like one question which struck me and I wanted to like 
ask both of you as like what your take on this is um that what is the kind of message you would want to send to people um like common people who when they are talking about people on death row that what are the kind of things they should be mindful of they should keep in mind if there is something as a check which they should have before like they talk about this to somebody else so um like is there something which you would want to send like as a message to people that to like, just something just be more kind but like a more nuanced version of that so is there something which you had an experience like that while working on the book and the report but like you felt I, that the only thing i would like to say to people is to be mindful and to remember always that they are human beings and uh, um um also to be mindful of the fact of 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 the loopholes in the system to be to be, to be mindful of the fact that if you, just because you have been accused in a crime does not always necessarily mean that you committed the crime and to be mindful of the fact that the death penalty does not affect just one person who is being killed mm. it is it is a much larger very complicated issue yeah, yeah and but I, I, I yeah i'll i'll just invoke brian brian stevenson and uh, for those of you who haven't uh, uh read his book or heard his podcast i mean please do read just mercy right uh uh i mean what i mean he he captures it so powerfully he says you know uh, uh what we all need to remember is that for all of us uh we don't want to be defined by uh the worst thing that we have done in our life right we don't want to be reduced to that the worst thing that we have done in our life and well and then while we want that we wouldn't want people to just define us by that one wrong thing that we did uh we should perhaps extend the same courtesy to everyone else as well yeah that's true but i feel that the kind of media representation also which is there like makes it that much more difficult for somebody to like be like that much cognizant of the fact that these things are there so in that like how do you feel that this issue also of like media representation can be like made better in terms of like what are some like basic things which um which like people should ensure that there should be when talking about like that bro convicts that the media should or shouldn't do in these cases the one thing is not to sensationalize the crime to kind of be mindful of of uh, both the accused and the victim and the victim uh, when reporting on on a crime such as such as these um uh, yeah ba- a balanced reporting that is so important because the media is very very powerful and extremely necessary in in uh, progressive states so yeah um uh, to be to to uh, to have balanced reporting not to rely on uh, knee jerk reactions of of uh, 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 the readers and to kind of uh, present a more balanced picture yeah i mean the media question is a very complicated one it's mm. a serious question of political economy and uh, you know how what is the nature of the media practice increasingly um with very little ground reporting ground investigation very little training on how to report on criminal justice issues right um, so what ends up happening very often is that um, media houses re- tend to rely on the versions that the state or the investigating agencies or the prosecution is feeding them right uh, and and uh, just don't have the capability and the capacity and neither is there a push from the uh, media houses to invest in that kind of reporting right uh, it is what sells that they are interested mm-hmm. in and uh, uh, very often the easiest way to sell things is to sensationalize and not to invest in these which might make for very good storytelling actually right which might make 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 for incredible storytelling if you invested in ground reporting how to report on criminal justice issues all of that it would make for fascinating reading but but i i just don't think that's the uh, economics and business logic of uh, uh, the the media industry right now and therefore it's i don't see unfortunately i don't see that improving yeah it's, mm. it's yeah yeah so in that situation are we just doomed in that case or uh, things will get no but but i think that's it's for people on the other side to then invest in challenging that narrative in interesting and creative ways right um right to 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 engage and invest in telling these stories differently uh, in a manner that engages a broad audience and that's and that's the job that people on the other side have to do right hmm. 
to suddenly think that the media industry will realize what is going wrong and change its ways is being a bit too optimistic. But yeah. therefore, to do the other, to do the counter narrative, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, because a lot of like young law students also uh, like watch our videos. So this is something which I'd like to ask you, Anu, that if somebody is wanting to like take a career, like take up a career in like research work or like criminal law work. Like, what are the kind of things they should um, like look at, develop their interests in? What are areas in which you feel that there's a like heavy need for like research in the coming times, which like people should be mindful of and should look at? Like, this is sort of a, like a career advice to people if you would have to give to like do the kind of work which you are doing. What would yeah. that be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean. Um... I mean, just as advice to law students, I would say that, um, and having taught for now, I don't know, eight years, I think law school is a time to experiment, right? Is to try and do as many different things and expose yourselves to different kinds of work during your internships and not think of it as, oh, I need to strategically do my internships and so as to get a scholarship or a job or a uh, admission in a, uh, law school abroad or whatever, right? Don't try and make it like you're trying to game the system. But expose yourself to as much as you can and then try and see what interests you uh, and from there develop your career interests, right? Uh, and and even if you choose to become a corporate lawyer, right? And I think what you can, what you should really do is that, uh, that you are a socially aware corporate lawyer. There's, I, I don't belong to the school of thought where I think, oh, people should not go and join law firms. Yes, I might, uh, you know, but even if you do, <laughs> right, uh, become a socially aware uh, uh, corporate lawyer, right? And that's that's the least, you're benef many of you are benefiting from state-funded education and that's the least that can be expected from you, right? Uh, and for those of you who are thinking, oh, should I take up a career in research, teaching? Uh, can I survive? Uh, or will, will I be uh, <laughs> will I be bankrupt? Right? Uh, I, I think there are, there are I mean, I can assure you that you won't be bankrupt, <laughs> right? Um, but I think there are rewards elsewhere, right? There are very serious rewards elsewhere in terms of uh, that sense of contribution and fulfillment. And there are so many areas in the law that are crying out for uh, very good, rigorous uh, research and writing. So. Um, and, and don't let anybody ever tell you that those things don't make a difference. They do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so this brings me to the last um, two questions which I had. The, the second last being that, um, so both of you have talked about the new works which is coming out, like Janvi, you're working on a novel right now which is going to come out, and Anup, you're talking about a mental health report which is going to come out soon. So can you like talk a bit more about like what is the kind of work which like you're coming out with in future so that people are watching this can like keep an eye out to see like what is the kind of work you're producing in future. Um, uh, the novel, um, um, I'm a kind of um, completed the third draft and uh, as I said it kind of explores uh, feminine sexuality but um, um, yeah I find it hard to kind of tell you exactly what it's about <laughs> these things are so um but yeah let's see where that goes um i'm hoping to finish it um uh, by the end of this year as in you know um yeah um hopefully so fingers crossed <laughs> yeah we'll keep an eye out for that and uh, and, and, and we'll keep an eye out for the video uh, for the film as well right yeah uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, for us, I mean, obviously the mental health report, quite a bit of work coming out on, uh, forensics, um, right. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, an area that is quite neglected and, uh, something that we're very proud of, uh, having developed expertise in, uh, you, I, you will see a lot more, uh, public communication engagement from us in various forms, uh, on these issues of communicating to a much broader audience. Uh, so public communication and is this something that uh, we're significantly investing in um, and uh, yeah so those are the uh, uh, big areas in which uh, 
We are also coming, we, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have something interesting on uh, discrepancies uh, and inconsistencies in bail practices uh, in certain states in the country based on a large-ish uh, data set uh, of, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, these are some very pertinent issues and um, like hopefully we'll get, get to read more about them as and when your work comes out. Um, so the last question which I have for both of you is like, we are just talking about being like more socially aware, like as people, no matter what you do. So what are the kind of like films and books that have shaped the two of you and like you'd want to recommend to everyone to like watch, read, understand? Um, can we start with you, Janvi? Yeah, um, you, I, it, it is shocking to many people, but I have, I kind of, I don't read as much as I should. But, <laughs> but, uh, but if, if, if you ask me what books come to mind um, in terms of, um, like, yeah, there's this Turkish writer called Latifa Taken. Uh, her book called Dear Shameless Death is a beautiful, is a, is a very nice book. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, what else can, there's Ursula Le Guin's Wizard of Art Sea, which uh, is amazing. And then um, um, Virginia Woolf inspired me when I was uh, a young university student. Um, so yeah, in terms of films, I'm I'm um, I'm a, grown to be a big fan of horror films and uh, Italian giallo. Uh, um, uh, the Italian giallos can be very interesting. Uh, so one director I would recommend is uh, Mario Bava. <laughs> okay, I'll note all of this down so that I can write in the description as well for people who want to check all of these out. Yeah, and over to you, Anup. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I don't know. Influence me, I don't know. It's sort of, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would certainly say uh, uh, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, as I indicated earlier. But just as, in just some of, just of the way we're talking about the book and, uh, uh, and then the manner of telling stories, Right, and of, and of discussing big ticket issues. Uh, I think two books that I've absolutely thoroughly enjoyed reading, which talk to you about big political issues through the stories of people, right? Uh, without uh, pontificating to you on the issues as such, uh, is uh, uh, this book called The Unwinding and An Inner History of the New America by George Packer. Uh, right, it's it's such it's it touches on such important issues of, uh, of 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 American society, politics, economy, and tells it so powerfully through the stories of people. Uh, and similarly for India, uh, you might be interested to look at uh, Siddhartha Deb's uh, uh, "Beautiful and the Damned." Uh, right. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's that's about life in the new India. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I know I've not spoken about books that have inspired me or, uh, but just as, just, just as good political education about these two countries in a manner that is not about discussing it in an abstract way, but telling, teaching you through the stories of people. Uh, these are, these are two books that are, I thought, very strong uh, uh, examples. And, and in terms of series, um, I mean, on films, um, even for somebody like me who is um, uh, has been exposed to the horrors of the criminal justice system very, very often and very, very regularly, when I still watched When They See Us on Netflix, uh, it still got me, right? Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's a very powerful piece of work uh, on, when, on When They See Us uh, on Netflix. Oh, thank you for these recommendations. I'll for sure check these out. So um, this brings me to the end of the interview. Thank you, Anoop and Jani, so much. You both have been like wonderful guests and like people to talk to. I got to learn a lot through this. And um, like I also built a deeper understanding of the book. And I hope that for people watching this, like it pushes you to read this book to like engage more with the kind of work which Project 39A does. And like just be more mindful of the fact that when you're talking about like death row inmates as to like what kind of lives they've been through and what the legal process is. So I'll just show the book once again for um, like all our viewers so that they can like check this out. It's a very nice cover also. And 
like i hope all of you check this out i'll put a link in the description as well of the book and yeah thank you anup and janvi thank you thank you so thank much, you, much. Thanks, thank you, much. thanks thanks janvi thanks bye thank you anup bye 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 bye, bye.